I'm uh, Ryan Harper from the IBM Linux Technology Center, and uh, today I'll be talking about doing uh, IO limits, uh, block IO limits in QMU. First, just a word, uh, some contributors to this uh, technology in the process here, some folks from uh, our IBM team. So for virtualization, we've got a, um, you know, lots of uh, resources when we do consolidation, uh, virtualization consolidation, compute cloud, where we're running multiple VMs with uh, splitting up these resources. And in many cases, we do this quite effectively with memory and CPU. We subdivide this fairly well. Uh, in the case with some of our I.O. resources, it's not quite uh, as easy and simple. Uh, in some cases, we'll have very large number of uh, virtual machines that are being backed by very small number of spindles. Uh, a lot of times this is mitigated you know, with things like host page cache, other things that uh, help make that possible. Um, and, and even in the network space, we've got limited out uh, going resources that all these guests are sort of being able to consume the resource. Um, there's uh, opportunities for uh, one or two VMs that are utilizing all these resources to have impacts on other VMs and, and their capacities. Um, some of the deployment models in these uh, uh, solutions uh, use a lot of simplification for, for management or they're optimized for other things like migration. So you'll have uh, VMs backed by files, right? It's very easy to import, export, uh, move um, certain uh, Migration models will use something like NFS because it's a simple shared solution model. It makes migration easy. Um, now that's great, but if we want to do resource limiting for I.O., uh, things like file access and NFS servers don't provide uh, any kind of capability for us to do this sort of limitation at that level. Uh, so what we want to look at is if there's a way for us to be able to do that. Um, now, if you are using something like block devices on the host, LVM, Linux has an existing mechanism for controlling access to block devices. So uh, there's a C group block IO controller. Uh, the block IO controller sort of has two major modes. Um, we've got the proportional control, uh, and this is implemented on top of the CFQ uh, IO scheduler. And you can create a C group. Uh, multiple C groups, and within these C groups, uh, you can specify uh, the various proportions. And with multiple consumers of this resource, the CFQ and C group code will sort of distribute the utilization, either IOPS or, or bandwidth, proportionally according to your settings between these different groups. Um, the other thing that you have uh, is just an upper limit throttling mechanism. Uh, with that, you can do upper limits on bandwidth uh, as well as IOPS. Uh, in this case, it is a per block device. So for your C group that you've made, you go in and you have to specify uh, a very specific, this block device for this group can only inject a certain number of IOPS, uh, read IOPS or write IOPS, um, or read bandwidth or write bandwidth. Uh, the upper bound for the block uh, device doesn't have any um, IO scheduler requirements or anything like that. It just is a, a flat upper bound, so there's no proportional shaling or anything like that. Now, that's great, but there are a lot of interesting modes that QMU offers for accessing uh, disks and other sorts of resources that don't actually involve the block layer at all on the host, right? A couple of these examples is you can run an image back by an HTTP link or through the curl interface, or your files are hosted on NFS. Um, these all require networking access out of the host before they actually get to uh, the ultimate block device. Uh, and what that means is the C group block IO controller doesn't provide you any solution for limiting the access to that. So what we've proposed uh, is to do this limitation, you know, the limiting in QMU itself, right? Uh, so what we have here is just sort of a very simplified diagram of how we're doing this. Um, as the block IO requests come into QMU, so via hardware emulation or Fred IO block or any of these other ones, um, those block drivers will submit things to the block layer, B, B driver, AO, read V, write V calls, right? Here, 
in this layer, if we have our uh, limits in place, whether this is IOPS or bandwidth, we first need to say, do we exceed our limits, whatever the settings that we've had. Um, if we haven't, then we can just go ahead and pass on the request, submit it to the next layer, and, and be done with it. Now, if we have exceeded our limits, then what we need to do is queue the request. So we queue the request, and here we're going to calculate um, when should we wake up? When are we allowed to now submit this request? And we set a timer, this timer will fire, and then we'll be able to resubmit these requests. Um, and then of course, if we haven't exceeded it again, we can actually submit it to the next layer. So that's what the, the current patch set does. So we need to see how we evaluate this. Um, you know, is this going to be effectiveness? Depending on your configuration that you have, uh, you know, settings on the host, your topology of your solution, um, can you actually use uh, uh, the different throttling mechanisms, be this the C group controller or the winning QMU? Um, for, you know, obviously if I put a cap in place, I wanna know whether or not it's actually going to keep it under the cap, will we ever exceed it? Um, and then, um, when we put the cap on, like for the C group controller that's at the host level, how does that actually translate to what the guests observe, right? Question? Yeah, you mentioned that you were using um, the, the, this throttling, the C group throttling doesn't help with the block case, but why can't you use uh, C group's network controller <coughs> to cover like NFS or? Yeah, you, you may. The, the, most of this talk is initially focused on, on all blocks. Right, so there are, I haven't really dug deep into any of the networking stuff. This is mainly block I.O. focused. Um, but certainly, yeah, host level network throttling or things like that should be able to help you, uh, 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 you know, control access to that. If you can identify uh, which, which part of the uh, block request, I'm not sure that it's possible. It will be done by the NFS client. You're right. And not directly by the process. Right, right. Uh, I, I, I haven't studied the, the, the C group network controller to see if it's got the same level of tracking. Obviously for the C group block controller, they've added additional uh, uh, tracking uh, in, in the block request to understand who actually submitted so they can associate a block request with a particular group. If they do the same thing at, at the networking level, then you could have a, a similar mechanism for, for host network throttling right, per C group. Um, and then of course the other thing is, is the cost, right? What's the cost of actually implement this and, and if so, where is that? Uh, so the configuration, just some details about the configuration that we used here. Um, I've got a, a system with a, a single SATA disk, uh, just to simplify this, um, you know, very large sort of SCSI storage systems. There are a lot of uh, you know, hidden details behind that. Um, so we're gonna do LVM right on, just, just block on, on the device. Uh, we'll put ext4 over the block device to introduce um, you know, file systems. Certainly there's some additional metadata that happens uh, when you're using file systems versus just a block device. Um, and then an NFS back in. We did some testing with different formats, obviously the raw format to take that out of the picture, QCAL2, um, other options here, uh, host cache mode, whether we're using cache equals none, let's not use any of the host page cache, or uh, cache write through, which is one of the default modes. Uh, and then the different block limiting uh, 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 solutions here, the group block controller or the QMU uh, IO throttling. Uh, selected a bunch of different workloads for us to look at. Um, got some streaming writes. This is just a, an MKFS on the volume. Um, a random read write mix. Uh, FIO's got an IO meter that you can run that does a random read write mix. Uh, random reads, that's an FIO AO read. Uh, random writes and then streaming reads. We did one and five VM instances, so one VM in isolation with and without the cap, um, and then five VMs with and without the cap. Uh, and then each of the disks that was evaluated, each was just a 50 gig uh, vertical block device in the guest. Some more configuration detail, uh, sort of an Intel server here, um, our five two terabyte drives, uh, two gig, uh, one gig next, 10 gig NIC, RHEL 6.1 in the host and RHEL 6.1 in the guest. Uh, and then the IO scheduler set to deadline. Um, so just a, a short little aside, we already saw this if you saw the performance uh, uh, talk a little bit earlier, just sort of continue to confirm that deadline uh, tends to provide greater 
uh, performance. So um, that does have an effect because as an admin, now you have uh, some decisions to make, right? Um, if you recall earlier, the, uh, C, the C group block arrow controller to do proportional requires you actually to use a CFQ scheduler, uh, at least in the host, right? Uh, and then if you're having to decide whether you want greater performance or whatever and use deadline in the host, then of course that eliminates the option of using the proportional IO balancer uh, that's available on the host. So here is our first test. Uh, we've got uh, sequential reads. So this is the disk read, 64K IOPS reading five VMs all doing the same read against their own uh, uh, block device. Um, uh, backed on a ext4 system with a file, uh, raw file, cache equals to none, and then we're comparing the two limiting mechanisms. Uh, so you can see here the QMU block uh, limits, these are the different guests and their current IOP rate. This is, um, they're both capped at a 64 read and a 64 write IOP rate. This is a read test. Um, and we can see that the QMU numbers are extremely close to 64. None of them really go over 65, so it's right at that limit. Um, and then in the C group controller, um, we're also underneath the cap here, um, but by roughly four IOPS less than, than, uh, than the QMU. So both these are effective at, at doing it, but certainly with the gap there of four IOPS or so, um, then you can see that there's, there's a difference there in uh, throughput. Uh, so this is the same experiment, but just charting the actual uh, 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 read rates that the guest observed given the same cap level. So uh, we can see here there's, you know, not insignificant uh, difference here in the actual total throughput that the guest will observe uh, between, between the two configurations. So here's another uh, example. Uh, in this case, we've got the same setup, but instead we're using cache equals right through, uh, which means we'll be able to use the host page cache for these reads. Uh, so something to note, of course, is that while we see a lot of data here around the QMU limits, here we're actually effectively limiting it. Uh, still make sure we're uh, you know, a little high here, but roughly close to 64. There's no data on here for the C group block IO controller. Um, and we'll look at the results here, and that's of course um, because of the host caching all of the data when we did a read, it was sort of completed immediately. And that means is none of, uh, none of those accesses actually generated a block IO request at all, it was entirely satisfied in cache, um, which is another decision point for administrators, how best to use this host page cache. In some cases, if you have limited I.O. and you have extra RAM, then maybe something like this is, is useful, right? We'll be able to keep I.O. away from these disks. Um, but if you're interested in actually sort of controlling what the maximum performance that an individual VM would see in some kind of offering, um, then not having control over this, because this is, this is variable, right? Depending on how much page cache is actually available on the host, right? Some guests might get this, other guests may not which case um, actually being able to impose a limit even though you have uh, it cached in read buffer um, is certainly uh, uh, something for the administrator to look at. And we can deliver a solution by limiting in QMU versus relying on the host block controller to do that. Uh, here's another scenario, same basic setup, but in this case, um, this is uh, capped versus uncapped, the sequential read setup. Um, the file is now hosted on NFS, um, and we can see this sort of variable performance in the uncap situation, right? You know, we're sort of all over the place with what our performance is as we consume network bandwidth to fetch these, you know, these requests. Um, and then in the case where we're actually imposed the limit, we're seeing, you know, fairly consistent performance throughout. This is the same thing here, just the sort of throughput numbers in this case, since we were limiting with IOPS, the performance uh, you know, is, is sort of proportional. These are all the same size IO requests, so we see an uh, a appropriate throughput for the given IO rate that we saw. So everything's not perfect. Um, 
in there are certain cases where we're not as effective, right? Remember the things I mentioned is whether or not we can cap, do we exceed our limits? So in this scenario, um, we're using, uh, this is a random, uh, random read benchmark, uh, cache equals none, QMU cap versus uncap file is on NFS. Uh, what we have here is the blue line is the average I operate um, when we're running uncapped. The red line here is our average uh, QMU cap rate, which uh, the number should be about 60. So the average, we are under 60, but obviously there are some situations here where um, we exceeded our cap rather significantly. So that indicates to us that we probably have some improvements to do on the algorithm to ensure that we're keeping our, um, our cap underneath. And it definitely knows the time scale here too, right? So this isn't just sort of a, uh, you know, a millisecond sort of blip. This is over an extended period of time here, over 10 seconds or so, right? Um, so that is a significant um, you know, rise above the actual limit that was imposed. Uh, so the cost. What does it cost to actually uh, uh, to, to impose the, the throttling? So um, on the left here, we've got uh, uh, utilization data. Um, you know, the three different lines here, the blue line is our uncapped case, so there's no throttling implementation at all, either in, in, in the host or in QMU. Um, the orange here is using the C group controller to cap, and then the yellow line is using our QMU cap. Um, and we can see, you know, just from a utilization perspective, um, we're actually consuming quite a bit of time to impose our, our limit in QMU. Um, you know, this is all the idle time. So even, you know, we're spending more CPU and of course we're, you know, less idle than the other solutions. Um, looking at trying to make that into a bit more of a metric that, that makes sense a bit, um, we can talk about work per percent CPU. Um, in this case, we take the throughput uh, that we're actually getting um, the amount of CPU that it actually total CPU cost that it takes to do it and sort of divide the two to see, you know, how much work do we get per percent CPU, in which case, you know, uncapped, we're seeing a very large, you know, uh, value here because, you know, we're, we're waiting on the IO anyway, we're not doing any CPU computation. Um, the C group controller in the host kernel is actually pretty good here. Um, and then our QMU capping, um, actually because of our high utilization, the actual uh, work per percent she was pretty low. Um, so, you know, upshot of this is basically we've, we've got uh, quite a bit of utilization in the current patch set that we probably need to look at to, to bring down to, there's no reason we can't be as effective as the C group cap. Next steps, obviously we've got some work to do on the algorithms. We need to make sure we're not going to exceed these uh, uh, those spikes as they come in, how do we plan for them? Um, reducing CPU consumption, that's clearly a problem for us with this first round. Um, you know, uh, we didn't do the analysis over all the data sets, but we have a lot more data. Um, but what we've seen so far indicates that we certainly have room for improvement. Uh, just take your attention here to the, the wiki, it's where all the details about the project uh, and the design is, and uh, open for questions.